that today. We'll go with that. But if there are some out there that have not been bit off, we're leaving them out there because somebody is going to buy one. <laughs> okay? uh, it's not like you have to, you know, I don't know what you do with it. I mean, like, listen, mine's out there. So if you wanted to use it for target practice, I don't care. Just buy it. But we're just saying we're raising money for our missionaries here, you know, in North America. So come on. Step on up, right? Okay. Um, I'm going to need all kinds of stuff. I'm just like coming so I can yell. But um, you'll meet your car in Redstone, too, while I'm out. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you let Russell loose with the mic. I'm still not. Oh, I, I had it on. Sorry. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> oh, be quiet. <laughs> See, they heard. Easter. Um, excuse me, Eddie said Happy Resurrection Day. Um, so, if we have any reason to be where we are right now, it's because of the day we're celebrating today, right? Amen. Amen. So, if you would like to, or even if you wouldn't like, if you would like to stand and join us as we begin our time of worship and just remember who we are here for and who our praise is for, and just remember how worthy he is of that. So let's, let's begin our time of worship.
Yours works. Good morning, Crossroads family and friends. How are y'all doing this morning? I just want to wish you a happy Easter and declare that the tomb is empty. Amen. So that is good news for us, those who have been resurrected and brought back to spiritual life by God Almighty uh, through a supernatural rebirth experience. And so if you've never had that, I hope that that may happen by the time you leave this service. Um, I'm going to put some things down here. All right, I'm back. <laughs> if you are a visitor with us today, we want to know you're a very special guest. And I don't believe it's by accident that you're here. I believe God is involved in the details of our life. He's sovereign, and he wanted you to be here to experience his presence and his love. And if you would be so kind to fill out the visitor card we have at the back, uh, on the table back there, and make that be a record of your visit. We'd love to follow up to get to know you, because we love people. We love people, and we want to reach people with the love of Christ. So I always have a question of the week. I'm always praying here before I even come up here. God, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to uh, you know, uh, mention? And the thing that the Lord uh, gave me was a few things here. So I want to ask you guys, um, have you, anybody here ever been mentally confused? <laughs> mentally confused? This past week, did you have an experience where you're like, what just happened? Yeah. Why did I just do that? What's going on here, right? <laughs> <laughs> Some of us more than others, right? Why? But, you know, this past week, uh, my wife and I and our 13-year-old, we went to Food Line, and she asked me to get one item. So I got one job. Just got one job to do. One <laughs> item. Cough drops. She'd been struggling. Um, you know, throat, allergies, and so forth. And a cold, I think. We don't know. Um, but anyway, so I go into Food Line, and I get the blue cough drops. She has to be blue. The brand has to be blue. The, the letters are blue. on I don't know what that means, but... I got blue cough drops. And so I checked out and um, <clears throat> paid for it and got to the, uh, the vehicle that uh, my family was in. And my wife says, uh, well, you got the cough drops? And I said, uh, uh, no. Uh, whoops, I forgot. <laughs> and one item. Can you imagine that? I don't know if that's an ADHD or what, but I thought, how do you go get one item? I mean, how do you buy one item and forget it? Right? Been there, and done so, that. You know, <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> so, so, you know, I got to thinking that, um, I don't know if there's trauma associated with ADHD. I don't, I don't know how that's, I don't know what that's caused or whatever. But anyway, I got to thinking, uh, the Spirit just revealed to me to tell the people that the tomb means we can be emptied of trauma. The empty tomb means we can be emptied of trauma. You see, we all come here. We have all accumulated some pain, some hurts from people and circumstances. And some of us have still those pains hidden that are beneath the surface that God wants to tell you this morning. He wants you to be emptied of that. And he can. He can. The empty tomb means being emptied of trauma and all pain and hurts that have accumulated to this point. You see, a lot of us have been fully healed. We've only been partially healed. Even as believers. And the Spirit lets us know that through push buttons. We have push buttons. And we'll talk more about that in my message. Push buttons are to reveal things to us. But having said that, um, the good news is that you can be free. Amen. Let's pray. God, we just come here before you as fragile creatures that anything can take us out at any time. But we thank you that on this occasion, on this time, you have brought here. This could be a momental, uh, a monumental, um, momentous occasion because you're moving. We can't see you, but our spirit can feel you. Your spirit moves, and you want us to move with you, towards you. Help us, Father, to feel you, experience you, and to open our hearts to you, to what you want to reveal and to do this morning. Today could be a history maker. 
for many of us here. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. At this time, I play a little music. We're going to have the children come forward. If there's any children here, we have a, a short little devotion for them. So all children, ages zero to, um, we'll take it to seventh grade, eighth grade. Uh, yeah. So if you're a child here, I have a little devotion. If you want to come forward um, at this time. I'm a child of God, doesn't that count? Children, come on. Come on now. Come on, y'all. I see some children over there. Jump in the music will bring them. Maybe the music will help them boogie on down. Come on. Okay, last week we had nine of you come on. Smart, she, she'll make that baby smart. So the baby should have had that baby Bible read by now, right? Did, that? Did she read that whole Bible yet? <laughs> She's working on it. So also, if you get a bulletin this morning, there's um, one of these little outlines in that bulletin as well. And so um, we're going to listen to a song. Uh, last week we had a special uh, service that we could feel God moving through music and worship. And I wanted to continue that because I feel like this song really ep epitomizes and encapsulates what Easter Sunday is about and what it can do for us. So basically what I want you all to do is as this song is being played and everyone here, there's some blanks on that outline. Listen to this song and put your hearts onto the Lord and fill in the blanks uh, as many as you can. And we'll see how many you get right at the end, okay? <laughs> So, something a little different here. So, let's play and listen to this song. This is uh, called Homecoming. Maybe you've heard of it. Sing my own song. 
Who's you on think? You've ever heard that song before? Yeah, that's a powerful song uh, because we all need to come here to thank God that that stone has been rolled away, right? Uh, so let's see what you got for your answers here. There's 15 blanks there. Is the song complete? <laughs> let's see how many you got. So the first blank is criminal. The second is shackles. Third blank is thank. Fourth blank is stone. Fifth is prison. Six blanks call. Seven is nailed. Eight is smiling. Nine children. Ten welcoming. Eleven families. Twelve home. Thirteen tomb. Fourteen tears. And fifteen witnesses. So, how'd y'all do? You get fifteen out of fifteen? Close? Elizabeth, how'd you do? <laughs> well, I have something here for you to try, uh, because even uh, when we don't pass the test, God's passed the test for us. And so, uh, you take those, and take several to people to sit next to you, because we are Christians and we want to share our love uh, and the fruits um, of love with others. And so, I just want to uh, go over a couple lines with that song, because it's so powerful. We don't have time to go over all. I wish we did, but we don't. But... Um, on that sixth blank down, it says, death came to life when he called you by name. Does your parents ever call you, come for supper, or mm -hmm. come downstairs, I got some chores for you? Yeah. But you know your name, you recognize your voice, right? Well, in the same way, you know, we can hear God's voice. He speaks to us through a spiritual tone, and we can actually hear him. And the first, one of the first times we hear him is when he calls us to uh, salvation, when he reveals to us that he loves us so much, but we have a sin problem, and that if we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, then he promises to cleanse us and forgive us and give us a new home so that we'll have a great homecoming when we die. And that's what means death came to life when he called us by name. And so can you guys recognize when God's speaking to you? We do have that capacity. Even at your age, you do. I was five years old and I uh, got saved, accepted the uh, spirit into my life, to my living room on my own. And so I knew at five, I felt God's presence and his spirit. And so God wants to bring life to the dead parts um, of our, our life. One last thing here, um, that song said, Scarlet Sins Had a Crimson Cost. What does that mean? What kind of language is that? You guys ever heard, what does that mean? I wouldn't know either. It's kind of hard to sing a song if you don't know the words. So I think it's important that we share a few meanings to the words. So scarlet is a brilliant red color. Some describe it as a cherry red or ruby red. Scarlet and crimson were the strongest of dyes or paints in the Bible days and not easily washed out. And sin is no joke. Its stain and coming consequences will remain until one receives God's forgiveness. The prophet Isaiah says sin works on our heart like red dye does on our t-shirt. It leaves an undeniable stain or messed up mark on our heart that we can't wash out on our own. This is why we need Jesus' nail-scarred hands to pay a debt we couldn't pay on that rugged cross. And so here is the last verse I want to share with you. We'll close. Isaiah 118 describes this color of scarlet, but also the color of white to describe the cleansing Christ offers us to wash our sins away. Listen to this. Isaiah 118 says, Though your sins are like scarlet, Christ can make them white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be white as wool on a sheep. Isn't that awesome news? That's what Christ has to offer us today. Let's pray. God, we thank you for um, these kids. We thank you for this church. We pray that you would uh, help us to uh, invite others uh, to come to your place of worship so that people can have an encounter with you and fall in love with you and want to serve you and experience a more fulfilling life. Because when we're in the center of your will, when we're doing uh, what you want us to do, life's just better. And so we thank you for offering a better life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. We'll take some to somebody else.
Amen. Amen. It's a beautiful day we have today. Amen. I'm just thinking on the way over here. I, I preached a good Easter sermon this morning. I thought she would. Jesus came to be born like us so that we could be like him. Amen. 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 All right. Let's stand and praise the Lord some more. We sing, Christ the Lord is risen today. And he is.
Thank you, choir. Thank you, people of God, for coming and worshiping together and uh, being spirit-filled and being willing to open your hearts to allow the spirit fill you to take the spirit through the world. Uh, we've been going through the book of John, and we've timed it so that uh, the part where we come to the empty tomb is here today in this uh, set of passages. And so we're going to take a look at what can the resurrection Christ do for you. You know, we live in a very practical society where people want to know, you know, what can this do for me or what can that do for me? I'm not really interested unless I know what you have to offer me or can do for me. Uh, it's interesting that in February of 2002, uh, UPS, the United Parcel Service, I used to work for them too, by the way, um, as a loader and an unloader, but um, anyway, they introduced a trademark slogan, what can Brown do for you? What can Brown do for you? Very famous slogan, very uh, catchy uh, to captivate people because marketers know that most of us Americans are not going to be very interested in a product, service, or concept unless it can provide a legitimate or practical need that we have that can meet it. And so, well, I'm here to share with you today that the greatest needs of the hour for all of humanity can be found in this slogan. What can the empty tomb do for you? What can the empty tomb do for you? Because it can do a lot. It can do a lot more than you realize. You wouldn't think an empty tomb has anything to offer us. It's empty, right? What does that have to offer us? Well, it's what it represents. It's what the Bible teaches us that that monumental, historical, most significant event in history, of all of history, can offer us. And I can't think of three more legitimate, practical, and most monumental needs that we have today than the ones I'm about to share with you. And yet, the resurrection of Christ, the empty tomb, offers and promises to meet all three of these needs I'm going to share with you today. So what are they? Well, here's three significant needs that the empty tomb has to offer to fill them. Here's the first. Here's the first. The empty tomb offers us a fresh start in life. The empty tomb offers us a fresh start in life. Many of us that come here today, we just need a fresh start. Amen. We need a fresh start. We need, we need some fresh breath. We may be struggling Conflict just seems to ensue around every corner, everywhere we go. We need to be <coughs> resuscitated. Um, and, and the empty tomb of Christ certainly has the power to reboot, renew, reset, restart, and resurrect your life. Uh, there was an Easter Sunday um, where I hadn't gotten much sleep. I was uh, probably two hours sleep, uh, working on a sermon message, and the previous nights only a few hours sleep, the previous two. And uh, I had fasted during that time, too, so no sleep and fasting. And my wife lovingly said, uh, honey, um, can I get something to eat? You, get, you need to get something in your body. I don't want you passing out while you preach. <laughs> and I said, well, be perfect, though. If I pass out and somebody does CPR, what a greater picture of the resurrection. <laughs> she goes, I don't know if it works like that. Uh, you know, people do uh, crazy things in churches, though. We once uh, went to a church, took a youth group there. Um, and uh, people were um, singing, which is fine, that's normal. Um, they had lyrics up on the screen like we do, that's, that's fine, that's normal. <coughs> but then what they did was they uh, kind of um, converted uh, the uh, sanctuary to like a, uh, where they were doing a mosh pit. They're actually handing a kid to each of the hands and you know, lifting them up. You all know what I'm talking about, a mosh pit, you lift the kid um, and move him across the hands or whatever. And I said, man, this is getting kind of worldly, this is getting kind of crazy. I mean, what if they dropped the kid? And so um, I called the pastor, the youth pastor at that church the next day and said, I don't know if we should be doing that. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't like telling you what you should do or not do, but I just don't know. He goes, oh, man, we've actually had that happen, where a kid actually fell on his head, and it was the most beautiful thing. I thought, what? <laughs> I mean, you can rationalize that. You can rationalize murder, right? I mean, how is that beautiful? He said, because people came, and they surrounded them, and they gave them caregiving, and patched them up, and they still felt loved on think, really? We have to do all that to feel loved on? Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Listen, we don't have to have a mosh pit here to feel loved on by Jesus today. But the tomb, the empty tomb offers us a fresh start. And the people of God will lift you up in different ways, in figurative ways, if you know what I mean. And so in that sense, we can uh, rejoice that the empty tomb affords us to be having the people of God want to lift us up and carry us when we're down. When one's down, the other can lift us up. And so that's, in fact, that is the Easter message Always, every year, the Easter message is always that Christ came to make all things new. Amen. The message of Easter is that God can resurrect any dead part of your life. That is the Easter message. 
If you have all the parts dead and you're not saved, you can obviously save you. But for many of us Christians, we still have some numb um, and cold parts in our heart that need to be resurrected and revived uh, and made alive again. And so that's the message today, that God can make any part of your life, any dead part, come alive. So let's take a look at uh, John, John right here, um, chapter 20 and verse 1 says, Early on, the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Now I want you to notice the time of this setting. Because God is a God of details, and he wants us to pay attention. It says early, while still dark, first day of the week. In other words, it's Sunday. Sunday is the first day of the week. And we know it's at dawn, so it's because it's, it's still dark. And so many scholars, in fact, believe this is Sunday, April 3rd, 33 A.D., approximately before 6 a.m. Because I looked it up, and the sun tends to rise in Jerusalem in April around 6 a.m. or a little before. And so it had been around that time dawn. And so now I believe that God wants us to know from this scripture, uh, this setting, because Sunday here not only fulfills the prophecy that Christ would be in a tomb for at least three days, right? So he'd be in the heart of the earth for three days. And, but the time of day is also um, important, not just the day of the week. Because, think about it, the time, dawn, early on, when dark is beginning to dissipate and light is about to shine. And bring forth. Listen, I think the early morning, the dawn, why God picked that time is spiritually symbolic of his choosing. Because you think about it, just as the sky gets brighter as each ray of the sun's light is further revealed, so too does the world get brighter as the meaning of the resurrection of God's one and only son is further revealed. And we can go deeper with this, with the word of God and, and the revelation that comes with the resurrection. You know, you can read through the Bible many times and God, you know, peel back something you didn't see before. And so that's what God does. He is a God of revelation. And so dawn also is one of the most spectacular times of the day, not only because how peaceful and serene it is, but also it signals the start of a new day. In other words, the start of a new day reflects God's gracious offer to forgive and to have a new day, a new start. You know, in baseball, uh, when you lose, they said there's a 24-hour rule. So if you're a baseball player, you know what that means. That means just wipe it away, forget about it, dwell on it, because it's going to affect your present performance, right? And so God doesn't want us to dwell on what just happened, the negative, the trauma, the, the, the pain um, of the loss or our mistakes we made. And so God gives us, each morning we wake up, a fresh new start. And that's what the resurrection is all about, a fresh new start. And so perhaps it's fitting here that this, in the scripture that says Mary Magdalene was the first person on the scene. First person on the scene. Scripture wants us to pay attention to that. First person. I, I couldn't think as I was help but think as I was researching this. It could be because possibly no one at this point of this devoted group of women and people probably had their life more radically reversed and renewed than this one time demonically possessed possible prostitute of a woman, which would have caused her to long to see her savior more than anyone else. Because the scripture says that, he, you know, when Jesus was talking to Peter, he who has been forgiven of much will love much. The truth is, we've all been forgiven a lot. So we should be the most loving people on the face of the earth. But you think one step further, I believe you can apply that to people that have been delivered from some most mental hell, like this woman was, because she was possessed by seven demons. People that have been delivered much can love much. And so I believe that's why she's hanging out, why she's the first one here, because she longs to see Jesus, to see if there's some kind of possibility. And by the way, a lot of people uh, position Mary Magdalene as a prostitute. You ever wondered why that? Because it's not in Scripture. And never where, you'll never find in Scripture the Bible where it says Mary Magdalene was a prostitute, by the way. Um, that possible prostitute affiliation, that came from uh, the Pope. It came from, in the 6th century, Pope Gregory the Great declared that the sinful woman mentioned in Luke 7, 36-50, was the same person as Mary Magdalene. So he's one that kind of created that link there. But who was Mary Magdalene? Who was Mary Magdalene? Well, we know that she was one of the of six to eight women. If you study all four of the Gospels and piece them together, we're not sure if some names overlap, so it gets a little difficult uh, when we try to piece that together. But we believe that she's one of six to eight women that witnessed Christ's death on the cross, including she was one of three Marys. 
that was there. The other two being Jesus' mother, Mary, we know, Mary Nazareth, and also Mary, the wife of Cleopas. But Mary Magdalene was not just at the cross, but she was also at the tomb. She was one of at least five women, some being prostituted to the same at the cross, some not, but she was one of five women to be amongst these early morning visitors to the tomb. The Bible also says that Mary Magdalene was part of a women's group. You part of a women's group here this morning? Well, she was part of a women's group. She was part of a women's group that followed Jesus, Scripture says, from the ministry in Galilee to the last day of his life, as well as faithfully supported him from their own finances. In other words, they, they gave money to finance his ministry. They can find that in Luke 8, 2 through 3, by the way. Um, in other words, to translate here, she's a dedicated disciple. She is devout and devoted to the utmost. In other words, she's a spiritual marine. She's there from the beginning to the end. She's loyal. She's willing to give her life for what he did for her. Because he gave her life back. And finally, we believe Mary Magdalene was a Galilean woman, probably from the town of Magdala. I don't know if we can show a picture or not. Uh, if we have that. Uh, you see up there, you see where the uh, circle is on the, the left there. Y'all see that Magdala? We believe that she's from there, um, which is the west bank of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, because back then, in Bible times, it was common for people then to be called by the town they were from. For example, Simon, or Cyrene, Mary of Bethany, and in time, Mary of Magdala became known as Mary Magdalene. That's what some scholars believe. Well, I also told you that Mary has been delivered from seven demons, as if being possessed by one demon isn't bad enough. I mean, can you imagine having seven demons? That's a lot of voices going in your head. Um, and so this would ensure an experience of mental health, to say the least. It's possible, uh, it's possible even some mental illness that uh, demonic possession could possibly cause as well. I'm not saying all mental illness is caused by that, by the way. Let's be clear on that. I'm just saying she could have been, so let's be clear. So by anyway, by Christ delivering Mary Magdalene from seven demons, her life was radically reversed and resurrected. Christ gave her a brand new life, a fresh new start. And scripture promises the same to anyone who comes here today that decides to cast their lot and put their life in Christ. Listen, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says this. Anyone who belongs to Christ, that means you have to accept Christ as your Savior. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a what? A new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. All things have become new, in other words. And finally, John 1, 12 says, To all who receive Christ, to those who believe in his name, he gave them the right to become called children of God. To become children of God. There was a young girl named Nicole Marbuck. And she suffered um, horrendous physical, sexual, and verbal abuse at the hands of a family relative. In fact, the abuse uh, was so horrible that it caused much fear and anxiety uh, that she didn't tell anyone. And by the time Nicole was 10, her mom had divorced and remarried. And at about the same time, she started going to church. And she gave her life to Christ. Unfortunately, the abuse continued. And because of that, Nicole believed that God was mad at her because she was filled with constant negative thoughts. Thoughts like, there's something wrong with me. Thoughts that said, uh, I I'm defective and unlovable. And so, by early high school, even though finally the abuse stopped, Nicole turned to binge drinking, cutting herself, and sexual relationships to medicate her mental pain. And so Nicole recalls that she also started pulling her hair out of her head, and, and in fact, she, started, she cut the statement in her stomach that said, I hate me. And by the time she graduated from college, she got married, had three kids, and she thought that she had put her horrific childhood behind her until one day when she was changing her daughter's diaper, it triggered negative voices in her head, telling her she was a horrible mother and her kids would be better off without her. Hmm. Through this struggle, it was hurting her marriage, and um, her husband recommended she get counseling, and so she finally went, and she was diagnosed with anxiety disorder, bipolar, and PTSD, among many other things, and was prescribed medications for each of those diagnoses. Well, Nicole would spend the next six years in and out of mental hospitals and psych wards, all the while being mentally tormented. And it broke her to think that she'd have to live the rest of her life like this. And then in 2006, Nicole met a psychiatric nurse at a Christian recovery center. And she shared with her that she could replace all those negative thoughts and lies that she was believing and had been believing all this time. 
She could replace them with truth from God's word. And so she began to do that, enter that process, and she eventually was healed and set free. Amen. 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 This is a real life story. And I thought about that. You know what? This, this is a living testimony of a resurrected person. That the living God can change somebody's life in this kind of utter despair from horrific abuse. That's been repeated in this church. Many people here. And that's why I believe God's having this message here to you today. Listen, she also began to discover who she truly was in Christ. She re received his forgiveness fully and embraced her identity in Christ, and she ended up forgiving all of her abusers. Nicole uh, is now a national and international ministry where she helps others struggling with addictions and mental illness. In fact, she has a book called Hold On to Hope, From Bipolar and Brokenness to Healing and Wholeness. So it's a book you may want to write down if you're interested. Hold On to Hope. My Nicole Martin. Listen, I'm here to tell you that God, just like he healed her and all her emotional pain, he can heal you too of your emotional pain and give you a brand new life. Maybe you're here today and life hasn't turned out quite like you hoped it would. Maybe a, abuse from your past still causing you pain. Maybe you're too busy to fit a relationship with God into your schedule or not like you'd like it to be. Maybe there's constant crisis in your family that won't seem to go away. Maybe you've been experiencing a decade-long depression or longer than a decade-long depression. <laughs> I talked to a lady the other day who was a Christian, a leader, strong Christian, a mature Christian. And I had no idea, because she's always happily and bubbly. She said she's been going through about a 10-year depression. But she carries herself well, because I never would have guessed that in a million years. <clears throat> Listen, maybe you come here and you're empty or lonely much of the time. Maybe you are here and you feel like you haven't found your niche or purpose in life. Well, God has one for you, by the way. He's got a great purpose for you. Maybe you've got a lot going wrong with your life and people, um, and you've been hurt, and you come here deeply wounded. Well, I have good news for you. There is no soul out there that is beyond the hope and power and resurrection power of Christ. Amen. That God can renew, reset, and resurrect the dead parts of your life. In fact, Revelation 21.5, Jesus says, Behold, I have the power to make all things new. Yes, not amen. just a few things new. Not 75% of things new. He has the power to make all things in your life new. All areas, all rooms in your house. But first you've got to let them in your house. You have to be saved. But some of us are closing off certain rooms. We're afraid to go there. Maybe it'll reacquaint us with old pain and we just don't want to go there. But you can trust Christ. He'll take you by the hand. And by the way, a real practical application, I believe this church, any church in this county, should always be in the process of helping people that are being abused or have been abused. For example, I, a lady told me that the, there was a candlelight vigil every year that goes on here. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. But Craven and Jones in Pamlico County, uh, they have a coastal women's shelter. There's an annual -like candlelight vigil. And I believe that uh, as many of us should get involved as we can just to support there's a lot of people hurting, folks. That's all I'm saying. There's a lot of people right now. There's a lot of people being abused. Children right now. Every night. You, you may have been one. I was one. I come from a broken family. But at least, listen. I tell you this. Jesus. Jesus was traumatized. Remember the scourge? The scourge with this? The cat nine tails? That would traumatize anybody. He was traumatized to take our trauma from us. Because by his stripes, we can be healed. And that's what the empty tomb represents. Well, here's the second thing. Here's the second thing the empty tomb can do for you. The second thing that the empty tomb offers you is this. It can enable you to outrun others. It can enable you to outrun others. That's right. Anybody here like to run? Any runners? <laughs> well, I'm not telling you that if you get spiritual, real spiritual, that you're going to start winning marathons and then that. And then money will come and all that. I'm not saying that. And I'm talking about figurative running here, spiritual running. But anyway, listen, just give you a little context here, a little bio backdrop. After Mary Magdalene seen that the stone covering the tomb had been rolled away or removed, it caused her to put her track shoes on. The scripture says she didn't walk. She just didn't walk briskly back to where the disciples were located and had been staying. It says it caused her to enter a mad dash sprint. I mean, I think she would have given you the same bolt or run for his money. And so we find that this tomb, um, 
being empty, um, it won't result in just Mary Magdalene running and put her track shoes on, but there's other disciples that are about ready to put their track shoes on when they hear that the tomb is empty as well. And so they're going to put their high school track shoes on again. Listen, it says in verse 2, let's go there. Verse 2 says this, so she, um, oh, that verse 2, uh, wait a minute, verse 2, okay. Verse 2 says, Mary Magdalene came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, that is the Apostle John. And by the way, the Apostle John, he's a writer of this book that we're reading. He's talking about himself here, that he's, he's, he's going to win this foot race, kind of bragging on himself a little bit. I, I think he was a humble guy. I don't think he was bragging in a sinful way. In fact, I think he's very humble because he doesn't even mention his name here. So that's, that's how we can know he's pretty humble. But anyway, in case you didn't know, by the way, the Apostle John is also known as John the Elder, John the Evangelist, brother of James the Greater, uh, which that means together those two brothers would have been one of the sons of thunder. He was the son of Zebedee. And they said, uh, they have taken, she said, Mary Magdalene said, and they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. And we don't know where they have put him. And at that, we have foot races on. Race is on. Game on. So Peter and the other disciple, that's John, started for the tomb. Both were running full bore, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Isn't that classic? I think that's funny. He's basically saying, I was first place. I got the blue ribbon on this race. But I think that represents his excitement more than anything. That he's excited to hear of this empty tomb. Listen, you know, now how far did they run? Y'all know how far? Well, we don't know for sure, but... Some scholars believe that the disciples were located back in the upper room because they seem, tend to hang out there. Many scriptures point to that. They seem to hang out in the upper room. And to the tomb, which many people believe is located in the current church of Sepulchre, which is about 0.7 miles or a 1K. So they ran about a 1K. If you look at the average speed for a 34-year-old 30, man, if Peter and John fit that category, it probably took about 7 minutes and 50 seconds or 8 minutes. Okay? It's a pretty good run. It'll leave you gasping for air. But listen, um, what's funny is this, is that although Jesus had predicted and taught them he had to be buried for three days and would be resurrected and raised on the third day, they still weren't quite sure what all that meant. They still weren't sure what all that meant. And so we, we, we also know that they should have been piecing this together uh, because Matthew 28, 2 sheds light on what else was happening in nature at this time. It says that there was an earthquake. That's just signaled in that morning because the Bible teaches us that there was an earthquake. If you go to Matthew 22, it explains that's why the stone was removed. It says in Matthew 22, a severe earthquake had occurred for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat on it. So how did the stone roll away? It says a super strong angel rolled it away. A supernatural being. Now did that angel's power lifting ability... Um, of that stone caused or signaled the earthquake to occur? Or vice versa, did the angel cause the earthquake to occur, which subsequently caused this 2,000 to 4,000 massive one to two pound ton stone to be moved away? It doesn't really matter if we do not know that. The bottom line is I'm saying they would have felt that earthquake, the tremors, it should have key, cued them, signaled them, you know what? Something may be back in the empty tomb going on. Because listen, there was uh, two earthquakes, by the way, that happened in three days. You know that? There was an earthquake, as soon as Jesus gave his last breath, and now there's an earthquake going on right here at the uh, resurrection. In fact, I don't know if you know this, but in 2011, a trio of geologists, William Schwab and Brower, took core samples of the earth near En Gedi, just west of the Dead Sea. You know what they found? They found evidence for at least two major earthquakes, a widespread one in 31 BC, and another one between the years 26 and 36 that would support Matthew's gospel with these two quakes. And so we know this, folks, though I want to say this. Earthquakes are going to come in our life. Earthquakes can overwhelm us. But the empty tomb gives us power to overcome whatever overwhelms. That's the good news here this morning, folks. So whatever reading on the spiritual Richter scale you're at right now, whatever seismic events, conflicts, there is nothing God can't help you overcome that's overwhelming you. I was reading a book by Brene Brown, and she talks about um, the definition of being overwhelmed. She said, overwhelmed is an extreme level of stress to the point of feeling unable to function or being blown, oh, being blown, or I call it being blown away. But before she became a college professor, Brene would wait on tables, and she did this for six years at a very busy, highly um, pressurized restaurant. And there were two terms that existed that you could use, invoke, with your manager that would determine the length of break 
like like a break you could receive upon expressing it. And it was this: I'm in the weeds, mild stress, and I'm overwhelmed. I'm blown. I'm taxed out. I'm maxed out. For example, if you showed the kitchen manager that you felt like you were in the weeds, that would communicate that you're a little stressed out and you need a break soon. Maybe not that moment. But on the other hand, if you would tell your kitchen manager, I'm blown, then the kitchen would all get real quiet and they would run to the hostess stand to find out what tables you were running to shift because blown means your mind is so burned and frazzled out that they assume you have reached a point you can't remember what tables you're waiting on. And so they rush to assign these tables to other waiters and waitresses, and so you can step outside or into the cooler or go to the bathroom and cry, whatever you need to do to get a longer break. And in the six years Brene worked at the, the restaurant, um, she said she experienced that point of exhaustion twice. Because she was, it happened at the end of triple shifts. She was working triple shifts in college, and because tuition was due, and she was doing all she knew to do. Listen, you may come in here, and you are burned out. Because you've been overwhelmed and overworked. But the Spirit of the Lord says in Isaiah 40, 31, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. Listen, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes in your life to aid you and to help you to handle any stressful situation that you may encounter or face. The Holy Spirit is like balm or boost. You know the drinks, energy drinks? But even better. Any energy drink you want to throw in there will suffice for that analogy. But listen, the reality of the resurrection is meant to add kick to our race. If you ever ran track, I ran track, and people that had a kick at the end of the race, it was something to watch. It was something to behold. I seen a, a track star for the University of Virginia um, in last place in the 800 meters. He waited. He was last until about last uh, about 200 meters, and then he broke loose. He was gone, and he won the national championship. At the end of the race, he gave credit to his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> God has a race for you, and he wants you to run this race with endurance and have kick, and so you can win the prize, and so you can outrun what you thought you could run. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 says, Do you know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize, so run to win. Listen, in order to run well, we have to hear well. We have to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And we're about ready to implement Disciple Path, which is a infrastructure of small groups and so forth that help people guide them along to the next step. In order to, to go these next steps, you have to learn spiritual disciplines, such as prayer, daily prayer, reading the Word, Scripture memory, journal, things like that. But here's the third thing, and I encourage you to come to the next summit, by the way, uh, next month. There'll be an insert in next week's bulletin. So if you didn't go to the first one, come to the second one. But here's a third and final thing the resurrection can do for you this morning. Third thing that God has to offer through the resurrection is this. It offers you front row seats in Jesus' house. Amen. It offers you front row seats to be with Jesus in heaven one day. It's the best seats in the house. I don't know if you've been to the Triumph Palace, if you had front row there, but these seats are better than that. I don't know if you've ever been to an NBA game, an NBA All-Star game, or a Major League Baseball game, or an NFL game. I've had front row seats in an NHL hockey game. I got to see uh, the team that Wayne Gretzky played for. He got injured, didn't get to see him play, which was disappointing. They're still great seats. Smash each other against the plexiglass and everything. Uh, pretty cool. Football on skates. But I'm saying this, as great as it is, to be saved here, one day we'll be face to face. One day there'll be a face to match his voice in our head that we've been hearing as followers of Christ. One day we'll see what Mary did because even she didn't recognize Jesus at the tomb at first. Look at verse 11. It says Mary stood outside the tomb crying. Why is she crying? Because Christ taught her and the other disciples that he had to be crucified. He'd be raised the third day. If she knew that, then she should be thinking he should be raised, right? No, she started like we do in this process of faith, trying to figure all this out, what it all meant. She's seen him beaten and brutalized. Verse 9 alludes to what they're struggling with. It says, they still did not totally understand from Scripture what Jesus had to rise from the dead. And so it says, as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, one seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. It says she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was actually Jesus. 
In fact, if you go down in verse 15, it says that she thinks it's the gardener. In other words, she thinks it's a lawn care guy. She thinks it's a cemetery groundskeeper. Until finally, he speaks to her, and she recognizes that it's him. And it says, she went to the disciples with the news, I've seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. Listen, it took her a while to get caught up. Sometimes we're lagging behind in voice recognition. If we would only hear the voice of God more often than not, we would be so much better off. Because you can't obey God unless you hear him. And even when we hear him, sometimes we don't obey. And then we get ourselves in a mess. And we feel that quenching of the spirit. But the bottom line is, God knows what's best. We have to acclimate our minds to hear him. I shared this last story here. Uh, this past week, Peggy Carroll, she's still here, Peggy? She's outside, okay. You can tell Peggy later, Alan, and Judy, and family, but... Uh, Peggy's so good to me. She's like a mother to me and taking care of me. But she texted me last Thursday to remind me that public schools are closed on Friday because of spring break. Y'all know that, right? Well, Friday rolled around, and I didn't bother to wake my 13-year-old up, Trevor, because give him a break and let him sleep in. And, uh, you know, because I knew there was no school because Peggy told me. Well, about 8.28 a.m., school normally starts at 8.30, Trevor's running down the stairs uh, seemingly in mad panic, declaring that he has to hurry up and get ready for school because he's running late. And I said, you know there's no school, right? He said, no, no, I got school. Why do you think I was doing my homework last night? I said, well, there's no school. Peggy texted me. I'll show you the text. What she says is good as gold. She knows the truth. She's God's word, right? <laughs> so he said, no, I, have, I did this test. I, I, I got tests. I got to do this and this, and so forth. And that. All of a sudden, I had that doubt like the disciples. Oh, maybe Peggy's wrong. Right? Why would he do his homework last night? If he has a test, I certainly don't want to be a bad father and miss his test. And so as we walked outside, because I said, well, let's just go for it. I got nothing to lose. It's just a, right down the road. So, all right. So uh, anyway, we go outside. He, he says, oh, great. Mom took the pilot. That had my backpack in it. <laughs> so I said, just get in the car. Just go with what you got. So we go to the school, and I'm, I'm oblivious that there's no cars there. I don't care. <laughs> I'm just ready to drop him off. And by the way, I think he brushed his hair for the first time in a week. Uh, he was doing things that he didn't usually do. I'm like, this is believable. <laughs> but then he gets out and he says, oh, wait, uh, until uh, I go to the door, because uh, just in case, you know, they don't want me in or whatever, for whatever reason, uh, don't take off without me. I said, okay, sure, whatever goes. And so uh, he comes back and he said, uh, you just got pranked. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I actually, I thought what he did was, I said, he's just trying to save face. He's actually embarrassed that he was the one wrong, that I was right. <laughs> In a relationship, we were right, right? And so I knew I was right. I was like, yeah, you're just covering her face. There was, you didn't prank me. You're just saying, no, I spent all last night thinking and scheming this dad to get it down to a T. That's why he said all those things. <laughs> <laughs> My butt was pushed. <laughs> and the spirit had left. <laughs> I'm just got to tell you before we go, we have got to be in close tight relationship with the Spirit to where we know our buttons are being pushed. Why those buttons are being pushed? To trace it back to the genesis of pain or trauma or whatever and to begin to unpack that. If you come here today and you have still a lot of push buttons and pain, God wants you to have that pain, that trauma unleashed given over, released to him today so he can begin to usher in newfound levels of power and pain-free living that God's offering you today because one day we'll see his face. Listen, I showed the youth today in the central class I was teaching this guy named Michael J. Excellent speaker, African-American comedian, preacher, and he said this. He says that our push buttons, listen, life will reveal, life will bring you people and circumstances to reveal where you're not free. That's what life's doing in that push button moment. It's trying to reveal where you're not free. Let's pray. God, we come here today. A lot of us here, maybe in different forms of conflict, maybe with the world or situation, family, friends. Some of us have so much pain, we don't know what to do with it. What you're telling us to do now is to get quiet and to listen to your voice. 
Lord, you have a supernatural way that no matter what is going on in our atmosphere, we can still hear from you. Even above all the noise, we can still hear from you. Because you're that kind of God. There's no barrier too great for you. Lord, you want us to know that you can bring any traumatized part from our past to newfound healing and freedom. Help us to give over to you and to start something new in our life. Parts of our life need resurrected that have been cold and dead for decades. We could be here in our 60s, 70s, 80s, it doesn't matter. The human heart is the same. Coldness, hard places can form and can calcify it. And they can become soft again, you want us to know. Help us to give over right now the areas of our heart and life that need healed. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, as the we come at this point where we sing our last song, I encourage you that if you've never experienced um, the salvation of Christ, if you come here today and you want to pray up here, I'm going to ask Tony if you come down and David to my left and my right. But that way we have other people to pray with you. That if there's some kinds of pain and hurt that you want to begin to uh, give over to the Lord and pray with others, you come and do so today. However you want to respond. If you want to join our church, be baptized, um, you come forward. However the Holy Spirit leads, you come. Let God remove and release you from any pain you still have going on in your heart.
two represents the offer to have all of our trauma emptied. Amen. So think about that. You ask God this week, whatever things may be going <laughs> under the surface, long-held, long-standing pain, where that's coming from, and to be ready to open your heart to being supernaturally healed of all emotional pain and wounds that God really does want to heal you from. That's my prayer. Pray with me. God, we can't see you here. That's why we have to live by faith. But your spirit is here. Your spirit lives in many of us. And your spirit is speaking truth to us that you offer healing and help for those who are deeply in pain and have been banged up in life. May they open your hearts to you this week. Because the empty tomb means we can have our trauma emptied and be healed of so many things that we carry around unnecessarily. So help us to cast our burden to you for your burden is light. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, God loves you. I love you. You go and love on someone this week. <laughs>